Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. Rama, 
हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा Krishna, everyone. So now is part two of the seminar. If you have any cell phones, part three, sorry, excuse me, part three of the seminar. If you have any cell phones, please put them on silent. And in the previous class, we were talking, Maharaj told the stories of Pralambasura and Dinakasura, and how these two pastimes relate to certain anartas, lust, and, and among different things, lust, and showing that serving the devotees and taking shelter of a spiritual master can help us overcome these anartas, as well as chanting of the holy name. So now part three of the seminar, and this will go until around one o'clock. Thank you, Marsh. Om Gyan Timidandasya Gyanajana Salakaya 
Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurve Maha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapti Tam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam Jai Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prastaya Bhutale Shimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvasesa Sunyavari Pasyatya De Satarine Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasati Gauda Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So <clears throat> there's a verse from Chaitanya Charitamrita that um so we have some handouts. For those who didn't get the handouts, just raise your hand and he'll come. And these are the uh, four verses that describe the Anarthas from Srila Bhakti Vinod Dakur's Bhajana Rahasya. And a little uh, visual diagram. Go to your left a little bit there. Uh, Madan, go to your left, go to your left. Okay, there you go. And the visual chart where you can see how the anarthas align up within the different categories. You can keep these. And this is very instructive, these charts. It's both the explanation and the visual diagram. Um, again, um, just for, for the sake of emphasis, um, bhakti to devotion to Krishna is the natural propensity of the living entity. To serve the Lord, to love the Lord is the innate quality of the living being. Just like the innate quality of, of water is liquidity, uh, the innate quality of fire is heat and light. So the innate quality of the all living beings is to love and serve God. <laughs> this is natural. It's not something you have to bring in from the outside. It's something you have to uncover. And what is that uncovering? The covering is the anarthas. Are those things that block one's relationship with the Lord? And it's usually due to our attachment to this material world and attachment to the happiness that we uh, perceive in the activities we perform in this, in this world. So getting beyond that means to go into the, our natural constitutional position of loving service to the Lord. So um, we use the word demons of Vrindavan removing the anarthas. So you might say anything that blocks or anyone who blocks our relationship with the Lord in a formidable way is known as a demon. So De Krishna helps his devotees by destroying those blockades that come in the form of demons like that. So our job is to bring Krishna into our life and recognize this seminar has helped us to recognize what are these blocks. <laughs> some of it are due to our past karma. Some of it's due to our present desires. Some of it's just due to unfortunate situations that arise without any apparent cause. So we'll talk about that in this class today. But before we do, I want to read one verse from Chaitanya Charitamrita. And this is uh, from Madhya Lila, chapter 19, verse 151. And it describes uh, our situation. It's talking about the living entities. And it says, all according to their karma, 
All living entities are wandering through the entire universe. Some of them are being elevated to upper planetary systems. Some are going down to lower planetary systems. Out of many millions of wandering living entities, one who is very fortunate gets an opportunity to associate with a bona fide spiritual master by the grace of Krishna. So two points. By the grace of Krishna, one becomes fortunate. <laughs> One becomes fortunate. What is that fortunate? Is to come in contact with the bona fide spiritual master. Now, the second part is to recognize that fortune and to take advantage of that fortune. So then the verse says, by the mercy of both, not just one, but both Krishna and the spiritual master, such a person receives the seed of the creeper of devotional service. And that seed is understood as that one takes uh, regular guidance and instructions from Krishna in the form of his pure representative. And that's the foundation to all progress and ultimately success in devotional service, is to find that person. Now, trying to find that person is the topic of today's uh, particular lesson, or this particular lesson. And that is that sometimes, we might even say, not sometimes, but many times, although the living entity is eager or has some desire to come in contact with Krishna through his representative, they somehow whether become cheated by finding the wrong person. <laughs> so that is called the false guru. So the false guru is the topic of today's lecture. What is a real guru and what is a false guru? So who knows the story from Krishna book, Bhagavatam, which demon represents the false guru? Question, just to see. There's Krishna killed many demons. And this one was also killed by Krishna. And that is Putana. Putana witch, she represents the false guru. And who is she? Uh, Putana represents what we say the pseudo guru and appears in two forms. So we get into the understanding of how this false presentation manifests in two different ways. A deceitful so-called guru who preaches sense gratification or liberation, or both. So here's one, one who says that, you know, you can yata mata, tata pata, I'm okay, you're okay. Here's a mantra, you pay some money for this mantra, and you chant this mantra, and you can do anything you want. There's no rules, no restrictions. You simply, you know, follow me, chant this mantra, become my disciple, give your dakshin, and you can still go on with your material life. They don't say it in that way, but they don't impose any type of restrictions in terms of how to behave, in terms of how to execute the process. So that goes on, it's very fashionable today, and it happened a lot it's still happening today, that people who are somewhat spiritually elevated but still are motivated by power, position, and followers pose themselves as gurus and then want to teach on the basis of, you know, it's okay. There was one, there was one person who was teaching I'm not going to mention any names, but 
and you can have as much sex life as you want. It's not a problem, but you just have to follow these rule, these this process that I give you. <laughs> uh, that person is no longer on the planet, but he had a large following, especially in America. And and so it goes on. Um, people come from India, especially India. And uh, there was one person who, as 11 years old, he was presenting himself as Krishna, not Guru, but God. You know, incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead who, who somehow again has appeared at this particular time. And uh, Prabhupada was at the time at the same time, and Prabhupada gave instructions how we should understand what he's teaching and somewhat avoid that. So you get a lot of that because people want followers. One time when Srila Prabhupada was, after he had begun his movement in the West, uh, about three or four persons who were spiritual leaders who came from India, they came to see Prabhupada and they said, Swamiji, you have done miracles, you are teaching these people bhakti. Prabhupada said, thank you very much, but why aren't you doing that? Why are you cheating people? Why are you giving them something different, something less? So, when the real guru appears, just like when the dark light appears, the thieves hide. <laughs> thieves become very, what we say, uh, successful at night. But when the light of the dawn comes, they run to hide. So in the same way, when the real spiritual master appears, and all the pseudo-spiritual masters are dwarfed by his presence and have no power. This is the case of Putana Wedge. <laughs> when Krishna appears, the pseudo guru is destroyed. <laughs> so that's one form of spirit guru's uh, false guru. In some cases, this may also be a person who is engaged in some. Krishna conscious activities, but has the but has not realized the course of pure devotional service, and tries to give instructions to his disciple beyond his own understanding, or without regard for their situation. So not be takes the position of a spiritual master, but cannot lead his disciples properly by giving relevant instructions to that person. And therefore, he's, he's not qualified to have that position, although he acts in that capacity. So this is one form, one who is pretentious and giving something different, and one who's not qualified but proposes himself to be qualified. <laughs> okay, and then there's another one. The, the spiritual guide manifests in the form as mundane empirical reasons. And this is also like Putana. In other words, it's not important that you take up a spiritual process through moral and religious instructions. We see people go to certain churches or certain, and they, what do they teach? They teach good works, be a good person, give in charity, like that. But it's not about, it's still within the realm of worldliness. They still say, God, when, you, when you've been favored by God, you get all kinds of material success. Therefore, you can understand how good of a devotee you are by how much materially successful you are. <laughs> and then when someone, you know, 
has that result in their life, they glorify that person, oh, he's blessed by God, like that. But the scriptures say that if God favors you, he gives you everything, but if he specially favors you, he takes everything away. And we don't like that too much. <laughs> So the special favor of God is he gives himself. <laughs> and when you have Krishna, you have everything you ever desired and more. So material success or material um, you know, prominence is insignificant in relationship to the attainment of devotional service to the Lord. The happiness, Nectar Devotion explains the happiness of material life is insignificant or even unnoticeable in the ocean of material enjoyment, a spiritual enjoyment, in the ocean of material, spiritual enjoyment. So Putana, she's there. Now Kamsa, he's the great imperialist, empiricist. The empiricists don't like religion, or if they do like religion, they relegate it to, again to just um, morality. It's not about transcendence. Transcendence means to worship God in order to please God and develop love for God. Morality comes in the form of being a nice person, doing good works. God is there. He's blessing you. Everything is great. You're getting your new car. You're getting your new job. You're getting your new relationship. I remember, tell a little personal story. When I first started to dabble into spirituality, I came across this one sect. And I was nice. They were chanting mantras a lot. They were chanting various types of mantras. And uh, I was chanting also with them. And then I had the opportunity to go to the first meeting of all the devotees who were in the area, and they would have meetings once a month. So this meeting, and I came, and uh, the way it was conducted was that the different individuals who were practicing would get up and explain how that since I've taken up this practice, now I have a job, now I found that girl I've been looking for. Now I got, you know, you know, I got a raise. <laughs> it was like, and then they would play, and they would have these big horns. Everybody would cheer. Yay, he got a job. He's no longer a bum, you know. <laughs> so I thought, hmm. <laughs> I don't know if this is what I'm really looking for. <laughs> so I went to one meeting and that was it. <laughs> so I said, this is, uh, uh, well, you know, sometimes you don't win on the first shot. But So I, I, I thought this is not what religion is to me, or spirituality is to get material success. So, but that's quite prominent. And the other aspect of false religion is to practice a process in such a way that you chant mantras, you also perform some austerities, you restrict yourself from certain activities and certain food, and then you perform various types of meditation, and then when you become successful, you're God. <laughs> You chant the mantra to become God. You worship the deity to become the deity. It happened here in Chicago. One time I was meeting with one group and I'm a very nice person. I was talking and I was explaining our philosophy. She says, yes, we, when we reach perfection, we become Lakshmi Narayan. <laughs> I become Lakshmi, my husband becomes Narayan. You know. <laughs> I said, um, hmm, that's not correct. <laughs> so they, <laughs> I told her straightforward that she's off. 
but she was determined to push her philosophy. So worshiping God to become God, like that, like that. So, and it's based on this false idea, which has some truth that all living beings are spiritual, therefore all living beings are the supreme spirit. But we understand all living beings are spiritual, but all living beings are subordinate spiritual to the supreme spiritual, who is the source of all other spiritual. Nitya, nityanam, chaitanas, chaitananam, eko bahunam vidadati, kaman. There's one eternal who's maintaining all the other eternals. He, there's no one greater than that person. There's no one equal to that person. There's only one. God is one. And there are the living entities are nityanam. There are many. But there's only one nitya, one eternal. So we find there are processes to become God. Prabhupada, many times in many of his lectures in audiences that he didn't know, people would say, uh, Swamiji, uh, actually, I'm God. One time he said, Swamiji, I'm God. Prabhupada said, please accept my obeisance. He's not said, now sit down. <laughs> and then another time someone said, I am God, I'm God. Prabhupada said, well, you're God, but we also know that Krishna is God. And I think I prefer Krishna over you because he... He's much more qualified. <laughs> and Prabhupada used to tell us anyone who says he's God is dog, G-O-D and D-O-G. So therefore we find that this is quite fashionable, and especially in the land of India, which has been exported here a lot of times. So the false religionists teach people to become God or to act in such a way as that they become successful in their material life. So you see there's two deviations in true spirituality. One, to take up spirituality in order for material gain. Two, to take up spirituality to become the worshipable object. <laughs> the real principle is that the living entity is the eternal servant of the Lord. And by serving the Lord for the pleasure of the Lord, one awakens their natural love for the Lord. And that love is characteristic, characterized by one understands I'm eternal, one develops transcendental knowledge, and one becomes unlimitedly happy. And so, Although we are not God, we, it says that the living entity, although not God, can enjoy almost as much as God because of our relationship with God. The happiness that one can perceive in relationship to the Supreme Lord is unlimited. Anandam Bhuti Vardhanam, unlimited ocean of transcendental happiness. That's available. But one has to take shelter of Krishna's true representative. So Putana, she was sent by Kamsa. Kamsa knew that Krishna was born somewhere in the, the area of Braj, Vrindavan. And therefore he was very, very eager to destroy Krishna, knowing that Krishna would be the cause of his death. So he sent various demons. And Putin was one of the first. Krishna was just a little baby at the time. He was hardly one year old. And so she was, she's a particular witch. She's known as Kachari. There's a, there's a class of witches. Prabhupada said, even now, they exist in the up countries of India, where these witches, they can, they can take a broken branch from a tree and they can fly in the sky. They're called Ketri witches. And they like to capture children and kill them. <laughs> Not very nice people. And so she was one such person. And she could disguise her form as a beautiful woman. 
So she did that. She came into Vrindavan, immediately put on another disguise. When everyone saw her, the residents of Vrindavan by nature are very innocent. They don't suspect people to be wrongdoers because it says that when you have good nature yourself, you start to see everyone else as good. So they sometimes, because of their innocence, they make a mistake and misjudge something that is wrong. So they saw, oh, this is a nice lady. She looks very nice. And she came into the, the, where Krishna was and she wanted to nurse Krishna. She wanted to offer her breast milk to Krishna. Now what she had planned to do is that she smeared some very deadly poison on her breast nipple and she was going to offer that to Krishna. Now, but no one could suspect it because she was so beautifully decorated in her disguised form. And so, Mother Yasoda and Rohini, Krishna's mother, they, had, they didn't suspect her of any wrongdoing. She came and she saw baby Krishna there. He's lying in his little cradle. And she sees him. And what does she think when she sees baby Krishna? It's interesting. Her mind said, this personality is powerful. He can destroy everybody. But it was a flash thought in her mind. She got a realization of who the baby was, but it didn't remain. She forgot it within a few seconds. And then she went unimpeded in her beautiful form. Now it is explained that whenever real religion appears, then the atheist or the, what we say, the atheist in the guise of theists become very, what we say, worried. Jai, Sisi, Kishore, Kishori, ki Jai. They become worried. The imperious philosopher criticizes the atheists by saying, you atheists, you're too tolerant with religion. But we know how to disguise religion in such a way that it, we know how to disguise materialism in such a way that it looks like religion. One of the statements in the, in the Bhagavad Gita is to take religion to be irreligion and to take irreligion to be religion. Not knowing what is the real religion and accepting the opposite like that. So Kamsa, he, he is what is called the perfect empiricist. And he disguises his followers, who was Putin a witch in this case, to destroy real religion. Who Krishna has now come to purify the planet by his presence. So, and then she comes, she enters Goloka, she's smiling. Everyone is thinking, oh, she looks so beautiful. So one of the nurses, or one of the mothers, is a nurse. According to Vedic culture, we have seven mothers. Mm -hmm. Your real mother, the wife of the spiritual master, and the wife of the head of the particular country that you reside in, um, cow, mother earth, the nurse, and which one, which one did I forget? The wife of a Brahmana. Yeah, thank you. And the wife of a Brahmana. So seven categories of women are considered to be one's mother. Mm -hmm. It's like people kill cows nowadays for the sake of eating meat, but that's like killing your mother. 
because a cow provides nice milk stuff, just like your mother provides your first food when, you, when you're born is your mother's milk. So milk also comes from the cow, and the cow gives its milk to the, its calves, but it also provides wonderful milk for everyone. And so it says that milk, cow's milk, is, uh, gives higher, gives, nourishes finer brain tissues, which are necessary for spiritual understanding. That is good cow's milk. Nowadays, everything has been polluted by commercialism. <laughs> so, these are the seven mothers. So she disguised herself as a nurse. She comes as, as a nurse, and she offers her breast milk to Krishna. <laughs> Krishna knows who she is. Now, it says that Krishna closed his eyes when he saw her. And his immediate reaction, well, he's a little baby, he closed his eyes. He wasn't going to sleep. Why did he close his eyes? And there's about three reasons given, because no one can really understand why Krishna did it, but there's some conjecture, some speculation. One is that because she had killed so many children before that Krishna didn't want to look at her. <laughs> that was one of the reasons. Two was that um, so she wouldn't suspect that he knew anything, so she closed, he closed her eyes. And the, said, the third reason was that he knew th that to kill a woman is against religious principles. Even if a woman commits a bad act, women should never be punished. That's Vedic culture. Women should be reprimanded and controlled, but never killed or punished. And that's the rule in society. So Krishna knew that he had to kill a woman, so he closed his eyes. In other words, he knew he was doing something that just is not sanctioned by the Vedas. But, under, but in this particular case, he transgressed that. <laughs> he can do that. <laughs> he can do that. So he closed his eyes, and then she very cunningly came and picked up baby Krishna, and she offered her breast milk. And Krishna started to suckle. But... What happened was he started to suck out her life along with the breast milk without touching the poison. <laughs> this is Krishna. Of course, the poison can affect Krishna anyway because he's transcendental. See, this is an important part to understand. Krishna is always God, even if he's a little baby. We see, we understand God as the all-powerful, all-controlling personality who has a magnanimous form. But if Krishna appears in his, his baby form, he's not any less God. He maintains his full power as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And, but that's deceptive, to the, even to the spiritual eye. Because we might think, oh, well, he's, when he's a baby, he's not quite God. He has to grow up a little bit, and then he be... <laughs> of course, that has no logic in it. But this, sometimes it's seen. But Krishna manif can manifest his full potency as the Supreme Personality of God in, in any one of his forms. He's never limited by the form he takes. He remains God in all forms. So even in his baby form, he understood everything, and then he sucked out her life there in such a way that when she realized that she was being killed, she tried to get herself free from Krishna, but Krishna wouldn't let go. <laughs> Krishna wouldn't let go. And she was screaming like, I don't want to imitate that, but 
she was really screaming and everybody was hearing this sound. And then finally, her form as a beautiful woman disappeared and she, made, she regained her hideous, ugly, witch-like form. And her body was so huge that it was the size of Vrindavan. And then she ran with Krishna still hanging onto her breast. And then finally she fell dead. And so, and of course, the residents of Vrindavan, not knowing what happened, they're innocent, they can understand. And then they understood that somehow Narayan, the Supreme Lord, came and saved baby Krishna from this hideous situation. Thank God Krishna was saved by God. <laughs> God was saved by God. <laughs> but they don't think of that in terms of, they think, oh, he's our beautiful little boy. He's Krishna. He's my son. He's my friend. He's my playmate like that. So they don't see him as the supreme personality of Godhead, but just the best of all persons. <laughs> So, so Bhakti Siddhanta gives a very detailed uh, description of what comes, what Putin re represents in his commentary, and it's very instructive because we see in today's world people may not be outwardly atheistic, but they preach or they propagate material principles, or they try to redirect true religion to good works. Mm -hmm. And so their desire is to suppress religion wherever it comes, like that. And they don't see any difference between material and spiritual. They say this is some false understanding where you say something is material, something is spiritual. It's all the same. So just like they'll say, oh, we see you, you're doing work too. You clean floors, you cook, you fix your automobiles, you also do worldly activities. There's no difference. What, what's so spiritual? That's the, so spiritual material is the same thing. But it's the consciousness that makes something spiritual and not so much the activity. This is, a, this is an important point to understand. There are certain restrictive activities that we refrain from. No illicit sex, no intoxication, no meat eating and no gambling. But we perform activities not for our own satisfaction, but for the pleasure of the Lord. Just like Prabhupada would say, some religions say, my dear Lord, please give me my bread. I, I pray to the Lord for my daily bread. There's a prayer like that. But Prabhupada said, we say, my dear Lord, what can I cook for you? <laughs> So there's a difference. One wants bread from Krishna and the other one wants to give Krishna bread. <laughs> so you see the difference. One is me-centered and the other one is thee-centered. <laughs> so bhakti means keeping one's consciousness on trying to do things in such a way that Krishna is pleased by that activity. That's called devotional service or bhakti, like that. But they can't see that, and therefore they say there's no difference because we're, we're, we're doing something and you're doing the same thing, so it's all the same. You call it religion, you say it is, you say some prayers and all like that, but it's not really. It's really about yourself, but you make some, some statement saying it's for God. But we can see it's all about you. <laughs> So, but th th therefore they criticize and say there's no difference. Or they want to improve religi religious, they want to improve material activities by be becoming spiritual. 
We have to be careful of this. Krishna speaks a lot about this. And one should not take up spiritual life to improve material life. One should take up spiritual life uh, in order to develop true happiness, or real happiness, which is love of God like that. So Putana, she represents the uh, dictionary definition of religion. Uh, they call it lexiconagar. Lexiconagar gives the definition of religion by a dictionary or something that is material like that. Or we find material definitions apply to spiritual practices like that. So there are many in the name of God who are not God. And we find that the false guru, the false religionists, the disguised materialists, all these things are agents of Putana who try to suppress real religion when it comes. That's why Prabhupada said that uh, if they know what I was speaking, they would try to stop me. <laughs> Prabhupada came to teach trans transcendence. Transcendence means to, the goal of this is to love God and to return to Krishna in the spiritual world. This is our goal, not to make a nice arrangement in this material world which is always uh, temporary and fraught by so many def defects like that. Any questions on Putana and the false guru? Yes. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for throwing light. Uh, I'm a little confused on uh, this part of the material. At least for m my perspective, I am just seeing like in devotional service, I feel like sometimes if the if our material life does not go well, then the service, uh, like I'm not able to render proper service at that time. So at that time, like... Uh, is it like I'm being more materialistic, like like trying to settle my material life no, up to certain that's, uh, Bhakti Vinod Thakur says one should m arrange their material life in such a way that doesn't disturb one's spiritual practice. So if there's some disturbance due to some basic needs, like one may need to settle their ashram, One's not in a proper ashram and cannot render proper service because of that. Or one is not economically stable and cannot maintain themselves, therefore one's mind is diverted towards that. So these, but one should not practice religion in order to improve these things. That's the point. So one should arrange their life in such a way that their material life supports their spiritual life and not takes away from that. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we also understand if one is sincerely engaged in devotional service, Krishna, by his mercy, helps the devotee on all aspects of his life. Krishna will also arrange for a devotee to get his needs taken care of, her needs taken care of, in such a way that one can practice devotional service, but one should not give up devotional service because my material needs are not being met. One should work on both of those simultaneously. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, you see yeah. the difference? Thank you. Any yes? Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Um, my question is actually more related to the second part of your um, lecture. R related to? To the second part of your uh, second seminar. Second part. Yes. If, I, if you don't mind asking me. Yeah, okay. Um, so my question is, once um, we start the process of devotional service, um, we can see Krishna show us our anarthas negative We can call. see Krishna. 
Yeah, the microphone is kind of muffling your voice. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, my question is: Once we start devotional process, yeah, serving Krishna, He shows us our, our anarthas, negative yeah. qualities in our heart. We can start to see that. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, and. Um, that's one part, though, so we can see the uh, cause and the reaction of our relationships, how situations come. Uh, so, but the second part of it, that uh, this anarch has, it dictates our behavior towards other people, Correct. right? Mm. And uh, unless we check it, unless what? Check it. Yeah. Uh, so, talking about myself personally, it is. Um, of course, it affects me, but also other people, the closest one, this negative qualities, and it brings um, pain and um, nothing good to... You uh, get discouraged? Not really discouraged, but the um, what I see just um, really hurts other people, like my behavior, which is um, this anarch has. Mm -hmm. So my question is just how to manage it, how to, how to, you know. How to, mm. well, the anarthas are gradually removed through the process of bhakti, but if you are aware of how your behavior is affecting others, then you can try to adjust that in such a way that it doesn't have that, what we say, unpleasant or negative effect. So that helps to reduce the effects of the nartha by actively trying to not be compelled or forced to act on. So that, that takes a little restraint. Oh, I'm saying this, I'm doing this, but it's not, it's not being received properly or it's not being received at all. So you can adjust things. And that, you just have to work with that. So therefore, Bhakti Vinod Thakur mentions in the Shikshastika prayers that one cultivates the proper mood of a Vaishnava by practicing the third verse of the Shikshastika prayers. So there is where you can put your concentration on. How my behavior will be pleasant and what we say acceptable by everyone and that is practice four things practice humility practice tolerance practice giving respect to others and practice not being eager for personal respect so these are the four items which is the personality trait of a practicing devotee practice to become humble we can practice humility. Humility is the natural quality of the soul's relationship with God. We can practice that. The practice of being tolerant. We do that anyway, but sometimes our tolerance level is not as good as it could be or should be. We can practice that also. So Prabhupada says we have to practice those qualities that we want to become like. You want to become humble, practice humility. When you want to become tolerant, practice that. Even if you slip, it doesn't really matter. It means if you're trying, Krishna will also help you by giving you the intelligence how to do it, if you're trying to practice. And gradually, with the chanting of the holy name and your service to your spiritual teacher, then those things will become natural. It's no longer practice anymore. It becomes part of you. You're, you take on the characteristics that you're trying to practice. And it's no longer an external affair. It's, it's a natural affair. Because that's you anyway, as a spiritual being. You have all good qualities. But because of our association with matter, we pick up these different other characteristics that are what we say, contrary. So just we just have to practice that. Practicing 
being humble, practicing being tolerant, practice, practicing giving respects to others. And you might, some people might say, well, that's artificial. I don't feel like it. No, the artificial point is who we are now, because our material life is the artificial part. The real part is our spiritual existence. So you're practicing to become who you actually are. <laughs> Does that help? It, you have to practice, but don't be discouraged by failure. Sometimes it takes years to develop these qualities. And sometimes it happens fast. But if you don't practice, it'll never happen. <laughs> or if I just act the way I feel. <laughs> and pray to Krishna, <laughs> and pray to your spiritual master for guidance and mercy. Those prayers are powerful. Those prayers are very, very powerful. If we pray, my dear Lord, please, uh, please teach me tolerance. I really want to become more tolerant. I'm not acting properly. You know, Krishna will help you. No doubt. If the prayer is sincere and the the the, the uh, mercy is, is immediate, yeah. So we have to practice. Thank you. <laughs> and never the devotional service is a win-win program. <laughs> But it takes time to develop these qualities. But you really want to know, just engage more and more in kirtan. <laughs> and if you just keep chanting and dancing, you become a nice person automatically. Because <laughs> you're happy. <laughs> kirtan is the fast track to back to Godhead. <laughs> and to all good qualities like that. The more we do, that's why we have now. Sometimes we do kirtan programs for two days in a row, 24 hours kirtan, 12 hour kirtan, this kirtan mailer, that kirtan mailer, this kirtan, sadhu sangha, five days in a row. And uh, we're going to Ukraine in, in September, six days of kirtan, five days of kirtan and lectures, just lectures and kirtan for five days, that's all. So it's all around the world, devotees are seeing, oh, this is Krishna consciousness. Of course, we have to do other things, but um, we, don't, we generally don't do enough hearing and chanting. That's our, that's our problem. We don't do enough hearing and chanting, which is the foundation of our happiness in Krishna consciousness. That's why I chose this lecture, because I can get to talk about Krishna's pastimes. Because Krishna's pastimes are the satisfaction. It's like the cowherd boy said, Hey, hey Krishna, you know, you just killed that big demon. How'd you do it? And they all gather around Krishna. Come on, Krishna, tell us how you do it. Krishna's not saying anything. He's quiet. So one cowherd boy says, you know, I know how he does it. He's got a special mantra for killing demons, and he's not telling us. None of boy says, that's not it. It's his mother. She gives him these amulets, and she puts it on his arms with these mantras, and she's the power behind it. Because of her, he can kill all these demons. Another boy says, You know, I just beat you in wrestling the other day. How is it you kill these demons? Come on, Krishna, tell us. So Krishna says, All right, you want to run it? We really want to know? So they all gather around. Oh, yeah, tell us. Krishna says, Well, when I was born, my father, Nanda Maharaj, was visited by this great sage. His name was Gargarishi, Gargar Muni. And he had a secret meeting with my father. And he said, your son, this boy, 
he appears in different millenniums in different colors. And he is actually as good as Narayan. In fact, he is Narayan. So you want to really know? I'm God. <laughs> so the residents of Vrindavan say, I just beat you in wrestling. I stole your lunch the other day and you were crying. <laughs> And now you're saying you're God. All right, let's go play. <laughs> In other words, the mood of Vrindavan is everyone loves Krishna for who he is and not because he's God. Even if, they, if he tells them he's God, they don't care. <laughs> That's Vrindavan. Vrindavan means, it's called Madhurya. Madhurya means sweetness. There's no awe and reverence. There's only loving relationships as a friend, as a parent, or as a lover. That's Brindavan. So when Krishna kills these different demons who invade his Vrindavan abode, he does it so these demons can get liberation. And he also does it so to make life a little bit more exciting in Vrindavan, <laughs> he allows the demons to come in and they harass the devotees. They take shelter of Krishna and Krishna kills them. They say, well done, let's go play. <laughs> in fact, Krishna likes to play so much that he forgets to eat. His mother is saying, hey, Come on, come back to eat. He can't hear. You see that little kids are like that sometimes. Mothers, they know. Come on, you got to. You're gonna. You're gonna get sick if you don't eat. No, I want to play. Don't bother me. And so they play, play, play. So the finally the mother comes and drags him. But Krishna, he doesn't. Even if his mother comes, he hides. He keeps playing. So what happens is that Yoga Maya. She rules Vrindavan. She sends a demon so Krishna can kill the demon. And after they kill the demon, everybody gets hungry and they have lunch. <laughs> so in order for Krishna to eat lunch, the demons come. <laughs> so this is, this is Vrindavan. <laughs> so there's no real de demons in Vrindavan. This is Boma Vrindavan. This is the Vrindavan in this world. In the, mater in the spiritual world, there's a semblance of demons, but no real demons. Just to give some excitement to Krishna's pastimes there. Because demons can't enter into the spiritual world. But in the material world, Haribo. <laughs> and so many demons. Okay, so anything more? Yes, Chandra? Okay, um, it, something you were mentioning about practicing humility, um, just the realization that was having that, you know, generally we're eager to do that when we're in crisis. But I was also thinking about when you're not in crisis, uh, maybe the fire is down, the flame is not burning as much, things are settled. Uh, we still have some things that we generally need to resolve to kind of move through. So um, I, I don't know if it's confirmation from you, but isn't it also good to practice that humility when things are not like in crisis state? That's, that's when you, that's, you need it at all times, because if you don't practice it, when the time comes, it's going to be hard to... It's a cultivation of something that is the natural. What is, what is humility? Uh, humility simply means it begins by knowing your position as being dependent. If you think you're not dependent, you think you're a you're self-made person and therefore you can do things and you can achieve things, then you put yourself in a situation of being, you know, frustrated or defeated. So therefore, Krishna arranges for his devotees to be put into difficult circumstances so they depend on him. But the real situation is to depend on Krishna 24 hours a day in happiness and distress. 
That means even in success, because there's a danger even in, in successful life, because one can become proud of one's success, and then that causes one to act in the wrong way or think in the wrong way. That I'm the doer, I'm the enjoyer, I'm the controller. It's by my arrangements things are happening. And then that's a, that's, that's a type of mentality that doesn't allow you to take shelter of Krishna. Just like there is a, there's, there's a certain class of people that take shelter only when things are rough. And they, they call out for God when, when things go wrong. But when things go right, you know, God's not there. <laughs> But that's not devotional life. Devotional life means to understand your position as being dependent on the Lord. We have dependent on His mercy and being dependent to know that at any time, because I'm in a marginal situation, this material energy can change any time. And one can be in a completely different situation. <laughs> And so even to prevent, therefore, that we say that when you remember Krishna, you're always in the best situation. When you forget Krishna, you're in a situation where you're subjected to anything could happen. <laughs> but when you're remembering Krishna, Krishna is protecting you, even in the most dangerous situations. There was that story where in 19, no, it's not, it's an ISKCON story where two very senior devotees were sent to Bangladesh. It was uh, East Pakistan at the time, I think it was. Oh, when the divide between India and then Pakistan was, was Bangladesh. There was a war in 1970s. You remember the war? Some, maybe some of you can remember. And so, all the Hindus had to flee from that area. And so Prabhupada had sent some devotees to preach in that area, two senior persons. One was Brahmananda and one was pushed to Krishna. And uh, they were both sannyasis and they had gone. And finally, uh, they were being told by the local people, you better leave, you know, your lives are at stake. And so it was hard to get out of the country at the time because the, the rebels were stopping all the buses going out. And anybody who wasn't Muslim, they were taking them off and shooting them, killing them by firing squad. So they got on a bus and they were trying to get out, but then they got stopped. <laughs> and then they searched and there was two Hindus, Hare Krishnas. Oh. Okay, they took him off, they put him up in front of the firing squad. So Brahmananda, he's standing there, and in the, all of a sudden, he starts to say, he turns to push to Krishna, Hey, we're going back to Godhead. This is great. Hare Krishna. And he starts chanting Hare Krishna really loud, and then push to Krishna picks on and starts chanting. And they're both chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, and there's no fear. They're both feeling like, if this is what Krishna wants, we're going back to Godhead. Hare Krishna, Hare. And the soldiers are thinking, what are this? And then the, the, the head soldiers said, all right, stop. Get out of here. Go, go, go. <laughs> <laughs> they became so fearless that simply by chanting the holy names of the Lord, it was like, okay. Krishna wants this to happen. We're not afraid. This is what Krishna. Wants. So that's that's pure Krishna consciousness. <laughs> that's pure Krishna consciousness. And Prabhupada was worried. And when he found out that they came back okay, Prabhupada was really happy because he was trying to contact them, but they weren't really able to respond to his letters. So that's an example of that when you're remembering Krishna. Then Rake Krishna More Ke, More Krishna Rake Ke. <laughs> if Krishna wants to kill, nobody can stop it. <laughs> and if Krishna wants to protect, nobody can do anything. <laughs>
if you have that faith, and that faith comes by practicing Krishna, just by chanting the holy names. So the holy name is the, the protection and the connection also. So in happiness and in distress, the devotee doesn't change because of material situations. Material situations change. They're like the weather. Just like yesterday it was cold and windy, now it's sunny and warm. So the weather changes from day to day. <laughs> but a devotee always remains steady, keeping Krishna in the front. That's all. Okay. Jai Sisi Kishore Kishore Ki Jai. Gornitai Ki Jai. Sisi Jagannath Baladev Subhadra Maharani Ki Jai. Anything else? Any other questions? Comments? Yes, Mataji. Maharaj, you were mentioning like Putana is a pseudo guru, represents pseudo guru, but uh, we also hear like how Krishna liberated uh, Putana, although she had bad intentions. He uh, gave her special mercy, as yeah. such, right? Like, so even though there might be innocent people who might be following uh, pseudo gurus, so do they have a chance that? Uh, they do get Krishna's mercy? Well, no, because they've taken shelter in the wrong place, and therefore they're victimized. Okay. Unless there's something that happens in their life where they change. Some good for just like Srila Prabhupada talks about how when he was growing up, his father was very... Uh, accommodating and very magnanimous. So he would open his house to traveling sannyasis, traveling sadhus. So Prabhupada said, there was never a time in my house when I was growing up, there wasn't some sadhu there coming, getting some food, getting some place to stay. Sometimes my father would host three or four at a time. But Prabhupada said, I, later on in his life, he said, I was never really attracted to them. I could see they were not real sadhus. You know, they had something, but they weren't. So Prabhupada's experience, but then at one point, he was walking with his friend, Narendranath Muluk, and they were walking, and then Narendranath said, oh, there's a very nice saintly person. He's giving a lecture tonight on the top of one house, and we should go and hear him. And Prabhupada said, Oh, I know all these sadhus. I, it's, it's, it's all the same. And he said, No, no, he's different. He said, No, no, he said, You go. But then Prabhupada said, He grabbed me by the arm and he pulled me. <laughs> he pulled me. And then I came. And then when I came, I could understand, Oh, this is a very nice saintly person. And then that was his first meeting with Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. So we could say it was the good fortune of his friend dragged him. So sometimes a person will have some good fortune or some circumstance in their life, and then they'll give up their false gurus and can take to real Krishna consciousness. But sometimes people come to Krishna consciousness and then, because they don't understand what the goal and the practice of Krishna consciousness, they go back and look for a cheap guru, someone that tells them, ah, you're okay. You know, you can have as much sex life as you want, you can do anything you want, and you can still be spiritual, like that. So that's unfortunate. Prabhupada says those persons are unfortunate. Somehow, because of whatever karma they have, they can't really recognize or don't want. I think that's closer. They don't want the real thing. 
They want something less, something cheap. And then Krishna gives them something cheap because that's what they want. <laughs> Vani, you had a question? <laughs> so, if somebody is, is on their way to death and they think of Krishna or his devotees, even if it's just in like some jest or some questioning, like maybe they're having a, you know, they know they're close to death because like they're dying from some disease, you know, and, they, and they're making some comment about the devotees, but they sound like half serious, but half kidding. You think it gives them some benefit? Yeah. It's mentioned there's four ways that one can get agyatu sukriti, unknowingly performing devotional service. That's in jest, in, by accident, or even in a derisive way. When you, you say, oh, these Hare Krishnas, ah, they're just useless. You, you chanted Hare Krishna. <laughs> I was wondering very much because one of my best friends, he did this, he was like dying and, and last time I saw him actually, the very last time in 2008 and he said to, he said to me, he said, I don't even know what, what to believe anymore. I grew up Catholic and he looked at me and he said, but what if it was the Hare Krishnas? And it was also some reference in a movie, but I think he looked like half serious, like really serious. Yeah. And it always, I always remembered him saying that because it was the last time I visited him. Yeah, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, they used to bring him articles that were written about devotees. And he would judge the article by how many times they said Hare Krishna in the article. Oh, this is good. They said it five times. <laughs> He wouldn't judge about so much about what the content of the article was, whether chanting Hare Krishna. So anyone who chants, even accidentally, they get, they get a, some purification. Or even if they do it in a derisive way, they get some purification. There's, there's actually a beautiful story in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. One Muslim king, he's, he was a Hindu hater. And there was one devotee, his name was Gadadhar Das. Gadadhar Das was fearless. He decided to go to this king's palace, he was a, a Muslim king, and try to make him Hare Krishna. <laughs> this guy was a Hindu hater, <laughs> and he would persecute the Hindus. So Gadadhar Das comes in the middle of the night and starts, goes into the palace, somehow gets in and says, Hey, king! Get out of bed and chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> He's like bold. And he, what is this noise? Ah, and he comes out and, ah, and he sees, oh, Gadadhar, go home. I'll chant Hare Krishna tomorrow. Oh, you just said Hare Krishna. Ah, and he starts dancing in ecstasy. Wow, you chanted Hare Krishna. So, and then Gadadhar's mission was successful. So yeah, even people do it derisively, they get something. Of course, for devotees, we don't do it that way. We do it to glorify the Lord. But still, because Krishna's name is powerful, and anyone who chants it in any form gets some, some spiritual benefit. In any form, yeah. And if you remember Krishna at the time of death, what is that? Yam yam vapi smaram bhavam takta ante kalevaram tam tam evaiti kontaya tada bhavas sabhavitaha. One who remembers Krishna at the time of death goes back to Krishna. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, yesterday evening you were saying one point uh, I didn't understand, like the case of Jaya Vijaya, the gatekeepers of Vaikuntha. Okay. How can they commit the mistake? Because just now today we in the morning we heard that somebody who can see face to face the Lord, they cannot commit any offenses. But then how should I understand these both? Yes, this is a, a point of discussion. 
Because the, that's when commentaries give different statements. Some people say they were on the outskirts of Vaikuntha, not in Vaikuntha. And others say that this was the Lord's arrangement, so the Lord arranged for them to perform that activity so they could fall to the material world and Krishna could fight. But still, beyond the reasons why they did it, the element was there that they committed an offense. In, in their service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, they saw that the four Kamaras were transgressors. But they weren't. They simply were wanted to see the Lord and just to get the Lord's darshan. But these gatekeepers, they were thinking that these boys, they were only four years old, were intruders and somehow they should be stopped. They had gotten through six gates. So beyond the reason why they did what they did, still there was some transgression anyway of the element of Vaishnava uh, Ninda. So there, but we could look at it from two points of view, Krishna's arrangement. And the other range, the other point was somehow uh, they were put under. They were not in Vaikuntha, but they were on the outskirts of Vaikuntha. So the acharyas give different reasons for that one, it's, it's, and both reasons are right. It's the, the well, you can choose which one you like, <laughs> because. When Krishna acts, he does it for many reasons, and not just for one reason. Does that help a little? <laughs> Anything else? Any other comments or questions? The false guru? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, as uh, Rupa Goswami says, like one should not over endeavor for material gain, but we also says like uh, we should do our best and leave the rest. So where should we draw the line? Uh, like do our best or uh, over endeavor? Like when do we know that it is an over endeavor, not we are doing the best? No. Yeah. Over endeavor means something that is based on trying to get something material from some activity. Bhakti Vinoda Kaur explains that in, in his commentary on Rupa Goswami's verse from the second chapter of Upadesh Amrita, where he says that in order to perform devotional service, there is a little arrangement that needs to be made. He says sometimes you have to go out on Sankirtan. So in order to go out on Sankirtan, you need a vehicle, you need some books. So that's some endeavor. But if you have to make a grand arrangement that we have to do Sankirtan 50 miles away in this particular place and we need only these particular books and we have to work so hard just to get the arrangement to do the spiritual practice, that's called prayasa or over endeavor. So the principle is that devotional service should be performed in the easiest possible way and not make big grand arrangements just to execute devotional service. Just like sometimes we want to build a temple. So all of a sudden we stop the preaching and put everybody into fundraising and Roy, and then what happens? That's prayasa. So if you want to build a temple, what you do is you preach, and when money comes, you then when the money is there, you build a temple, or you get other people to build a temple for you. <laughs> so the idea is not to sacrifice the natural inclination to serve the Lord in order to make big arrangements to do some service. It's, that's the idea. He mentions that in Shikshamrita, Bhakti Vinoda Kaur. He says devotional service is natural, it's easy.
<laughs> Does that help? Hmm. You sure? You don't look convinced. It's okay? Okay. You want to say something else? Okay. Okay. Yes. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Um, on the topic of false guru, I was wondering what the proper understanding is between um, some of the people that used to influence us before, for example, parents or friends that, you know, for example, when I came to Krishna, Con when I was trying to come to Krishna consciousness, my family and parents were saying, no, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And I just, I, I listened to the devotees when they were saying, no, do it, do it, you should come. So I, I chose to listen to them, but now that I'm here, I'm wondering, sometimes, you know, I'm just telling my parents or my grandparents what kind of things I'm doing and know I'm going to be doing this and this and they try to give some advice so oh maybe you should try it like this or this way they they still you know naturally just give some yeah, advice. You're, you're a normal person because it happens to a lot of people <laughs> it's a normal thing the thing is you you're actually helping them anyone who becomes a devotee also their family members benefit by their devotional service they get the mercy of Krishna. So although they don't recognize that, if you actually want to help them as a son or someone who cares about them, become a devotee and they'll benefit also. And if you become a pure devotee, then you can liberate 14 generations of your family members. And then they get actually pure devotional service in their next life. So we don't give up spiritual activities just to patronize family values, you know. I mean, even the Bible says, you know, you know, one should, you know, put the hand on the plow and look forward and don't look back. In other words, you know, the worldly people will always give you reasons why you shouldn't practice spiritual life. They'll always say, you know, you have to earn money, you have to get a good job, you have to get a good family, you have to live in a country, you have to have a dog, you have to have a computer, you have to have this. Well, you're miserable, I know, but you should be miserable like me too. <laughs> and that's called f family love. <laughs> so, yeah. So we don't, f it's like, people don't understand the value of spiritual life because it benefits not only hey Prabhupada says when Krishna is pleased the whole world benefits what to speak about just the family members or even one's community um, devotional service is all auspicious so we're polite respectful with our relatives and friends, but we're, we don't compromise what is real just to be a nice family member. Yeah. And you find that, and that happens a lot with family members. They want, they say, all right, if you want to be spiritual, do it after 50 years of well, 60 years, when you get old and you can't do anything else. But Prahlad Maharaj speaks against that. He tells his schoolmates, you know, you take up Krishna consciousness. And what do they say? But Prahlad, we're young. We want to play. When we get old, we'll do it. And Prahlad says, old means just before you die. And then he goes on to explain, death doesn't really give notice. So death may come at any time. So therefore, it's always the need of the time. <laughs> It's always the need of the time. Because we have to see what what value I'm doing in, for myself and for others. I'm connecting with God and I'm becoming... And you know, sometimes when you stay, and many times when you stay in Krishna consciousness, you see the parents say, oh, my kid's a nice... He doesn't, you know, go out and do drugs. He doesn't drink. doesn't get in trouble. He's actually developing becoming a nice person. Well, this, maybe this spiritual life is nice. So they start appreciating, not so much the process, but about how it's changed their son and daughter into a better person. They see that. And if you stick with it, you'll see that after a while. 
they actually start to appreciate because they can see, oh, you've become a better person. But we can't give up truth in the name of, you know, some kind of family sentiment. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could say other things in relationship to that, but, but basically that's the essence. I mean, we're connected with this family in this life, and next, in the previous life we had a different set of family members. And if we come back again, we'll get enough different sets. So who's the real family? <laughs> who's... Yeah, just like when Srivas Thakur's son died during the kirtan in Srivas's house, Lord Chaitanya realized what happened. He went back and saw that the little boy, four years old, he had died, and the family members were in distress. So Lord Chaitanya came, he put his hand on the boy's chest, the boy rose up and said, Lord Chaitanya said, where did you go? He said, I'm your eternal servant. I'm by your will and by your order, I have left and I'm going on to my destination. But what about your parents? He said, who are they? <laughs> I had so many parents. Which life, is, which parents are the real ones? <laughs> which, which, which mother, which father is the real one? So we play the roles of mother, father, friend, this, these are all roles we play. In every life, there's a different stage performance. Okay. So don't get caught up in the roles. <laughs> Krishna Matta, Krishna Pita, Krishna Dana Pran. <laughs> Krishna is your mother, Krishna is your father, Krishna is the treasure of your life, Krishna is your life. When you bring Krishna into your life, you actually live. And your family members in any generation, they also become benefited. Even if they were even if they're atheists, they still become benefited. Look what happened to Pallad Maharaj. He made his father, he was killed by Rani Kashipu. I mean, Rani Kashipu was killed by Lord Nishringadev. He got liberation because he had a son who was a great devotee. <laughs> And that's the benefit of being a devotee. Mm -hmm. Yes. Maharaj, just an extension of uh, that Prabhu's question. Uh, particularly, uh, I work in a software company, so I know that sometimes the work becomes so crazy around the clock and the meetings and it's hard even to cover up my 16 rounds okay so at one side i see that you know should i really undergo these problems like you know what kind of crazy job i am in but the other side i feel you know if that is not there then how am i going to balance my material and the spiritual life it's an important so a prayasa is something confusing for me in these scenarios when something comes up very high and i have to dedicate a lot of time for that and i don't get much time in devotion then what should we really think and what is the right way of uh, approach understanding well, how to become Krishna consciousness in the workplace. <laughs> how to stay Krishna conscious in the midst of all these other things that, that have become our responsibilities. And that takes strong sadhana. <laughs> you have to have strong sadhana. Or, if you feel like it's too much, then you can reduce that. <laughs> and then what, what happens? Just like people come to me and they say, Oh, Maharaj. Ever since I take up Krishna consciousness, I don't have any taste for my job anymore. I said, great, you're making progress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I don't tell them to stop their job, but I say, okay. So Lord Chaitanya gave the formula. 
he talks about how to live in the world and yet and still become Krishna conscious with worldly responsibilities. He uses an analogy. The analogy is, this is interesting, a woman has a husband, but she also has a lover. <laughs> and so she's more interested in her lover than her husband. But in order for her husband not to suspect her other program, she does her service to her husband real nice. So he doesn't suspect. But at the same time, she's always thinking, when can I go and meet him? <laughs> so her heart's there, but her duty is still with her husband. So, Lord Chaitanya says, this is how we have to live in the world. We have to do our material duties, but we keep our heart with Krishna. It's a little tough sometimes, because you're doing material duties and you get caught up in them. And you become part of it at the same time. But try not to let that happen. And sometimes we just have to reduce that just to get a breather from that. Yeah, and, and then eventually, sometimes people just give it up and just say, forget it, I'm just going to chant Hare Krishna and, and take prasad. <laughs> but you have to see. Every situation may be a little different, seeing of, depending on your responsibilities that you have. But Vedic culture talks about as life goes on, we reduce our material responsibilities and we increase our spiritual activities. It's not like you're going to stay in that position forever. <laughs> right? Yeah. So that's called making the best use of a bad bargain. <laughs> Still, you do your work nicely when you're with your job. You do it nicely, not like you're carelessly or what we say, neglectfully or whatever. But at the same time, you know, you, you keep your mind in Krishna, you keep your heart with Krishna. Otherwise, if you get too much wrapped up in there, then you, you find yourself stressed out. Mm. You have to learn how to play both worlds. <laughs> It's hard sometimes. Another question? Okay, should we take another demon? Oh, it's one o'clock almost. Is that 1253? 59, that means we're supposed to end at one, right? Okay, so I'll we'll talk about um, Vatsasura is the next demon, and he's interesting. You can maybe read up a little bit of it. And that, the next class is at four, four o'clock. Okay, so you have some time for lunch. And those who want to meet me for personal discussion, um, you can see Shiv, and then we can make a time for that. And then we also have some time designated for that tomorrow. Before we end, again, I want to emphasize uh, Mother Vishaka's uh, book table out there. She's raising money in order to pro proliferate this film. Hare Krishna, the mantra, the movement, and the Swami who made it happen. So she's offering books, two books, one is her personal biography, and the other one is a beautiful book connecting Bhagavad Gita with nature called Harmony for $25 donation. And she also has a wonderful t-shirt for $20 donation. It all goes to help finance the, the production of, or the uh, proliferation of this, mo this movie that's just recently been released on the life of Srila Prabhupada. Okay, so thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hare Krishna Maha Mantra Ki Jai.
the garland came just in time. <laughs> Hi Krishna everyone, just two quick announcements. Prasanna will be upstairs in the same place it was in breakfast, up on the third floor. And if you haven't registered, please see Shanti Mataji in the front lobby to register. And the parking is in the back lot. Thank you. Hare Krishna.